So last December, I moved my mom down here and my eldest son moved down at the same time. He's 31. He brought a pig, pot belly pig with him that he had acquired. He would call her Miss Piggy. And then one day he said, Dad, what's that underneath her? I said, son, that's her penis. Now, when we first got to our homestead, we wanted to raise goats and sheep. After realizing that we don't have the right pasture to raise goats, we decided to stay with sheep. We first went to go visit our friend Lorraine at Purple Lamb Homestead. Then we went to go visit Chuck and his lovely wife Heather at the Bessie Ranch. One of our first inquiries was what type of sheep they were raising and why. So the uh, original ewes were Royal Whites, which is a Dorper St. Croix cross. Uh -huh. And then I bred them back to a Dorper Ram. Okay. So these guys are all, I guess, a mix of St. Croix Dorper. Okay. <laughs> They're hair sheep. Okay. Being in Northeast Texas, I needed something that was pretty heat resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, you know, big wool and then parasite resistant. We have 12 acres. So it's split between... The goats have a, the goats and sheep have about three acres. We've got a couple acres and the rest is for the cattle with the pond. Yeah, they, they've got from the barn all the way back to the corner and up to here. Uh, we close them up at night, keep them safe from the predators. One thing we tell everybody that buys a goat, or you got to keep them safe. Yeah. They are prey animals. Mm -hmm. And we've had people that didn't quite follow our, what we said and a couple days later they lost their goats. All right. Well, let's take a look at some of your, your sheep there. Now, when uh, getting sheep, we didn't want to start off big, so we wanted to know how many did they start off with and how many they have now. We started out, we got two. Okay. One of them we don't have anymore, and then the, the one second from the left, we got them. It turns out that this one was pregnant, and she had the lamb ram, spam the ram lamb, that we butchered last year. Uh, then we acquired two more girls, and then a couple weeks later we got Skippy. <laughs> uh, now we got three adult ewes. We got five young ewes that were born in the spring and three rams. Come here, Sandy. You gonna come say hi? He's not quite as sociable as he used to be. Come here. Come here, Aww. buddy. Come here. Come here. Okay, and that's the wool sheep. Yeah, and that's what's interesting is out of the babies, most of them have, uh, there's a couple of them they're hair sheep because a couple of the mothers are just hair sheep. They don't have the wool. Mm -hmm. But daddy definitely has wool. <laughs> and it seems like most of the babies have wool, but not as much as he did. Uh, two originally, two ewes, uh -huh. and then I bought a ram a couple months later. So three was my original starting. So those are your original flocks that you yeah. keep, that you've been keeping in with here? Um, we, well, I sold the ram and then I processed the ewe, one of them recently. So <laughs> okay. I only have one original ewe. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I always wanted to do. I did have this broken down a little bit more mm -hmm. before, and I'll show you kind of how I used to do it. Uh -huh. But once I got chickens, and now the chickens have range of the back and the front, I don't want to put the sheep after the chickens. Yeah. So it kind of killed the whole rotational thing <laughs> I had going. Yeah. Um, but they still have about an acre and a half that they run around on. Now, having a larger animal on the homestead, I was curious, how would it be raising these sheep on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, sure, when it's summertime or spring and I don't have to supplement feed, um, I just make sure the water's clean. That's it, and, and that's... How, how often do you do you refill the water or you just fill it up or replace it? What's the process? Uh, depending on how dirty it is, I do have a burlap sack in there that is supposed to keep, I guess, algae down to a minimum. Okay. It does work, but um, I'd say twice a week, I'm emptying it out and filling it back up. Okay. In the morning, I just make sure they have clean water mm -hmm. and I count everybody <laughs> <laughs> every morning. Uh, and then I go to work because I work from home. Uh, but then the afternoons is when I'll come in and I'll give them some extra alfalfa pellets or, you know, hay if I have it. Okay. If they need it. And then just check on water again. Day to day, they are super easy. With the sheep and goats, it, it's all combined. Uh -huh. um, at night, like I said, I close them up. So in the morning, we come out with the cow milk and stuff. And we get out here and then when, well, she takes care of milking the cow. While she's getting set up, I will bring feed out, put the feed out, and then open the doors and get out of the way. Because <laughs> there is a stampede of all the goats and the sheep come running out for that food. Once they're out, or depending on how quick we're moving, I'll get the feed for the cow and get her into position so, we can, so she can milk. Pour the food in, get her set up, she starts milk, and then I'll come out and I'll open up the chickens. And by the time she finishes milking the cow, goats and sheep are typically finishing up with their feed and they just mosey off and 
do this all day. <laughs> and then when it gets close to dark, you'll find them all up close to the barn. Ready to come in. When I come out at, you know, 10, 9.30 to 10.30 to 11, whatever time, if it's really nice out, there'll be more of them just laying out outside enjoying the, the weather. And I just come out and I say, all right, everybody, time for bed. And they'll get up and usually they're very cooperative and just go right in. I'll close the doors, go in, count, make sure we got everybody. Lock them up for the night. Now we knew from the beginning that we did not have enough property for cows. So that's why we really considered goats or sheep. And sheep are turning out to be the perfect animal for us. But we need to consider what type of maintenance is involved with this type of animal before getting it. That's why it was so important to make these visits and go see people. And it really comes down to deworming and hoof care has been the two things that just kind of came out of this. We had to deal with worms a couple times. That's one problem that you have to worry about with goats and sheep is when the grass gets too short, yeah. they get the parasites. Mm -hmm. And we, we dealt with that a couple times. Uh, we were having to actually get them some hay to eat. It wasn't as bad as some people. We didn't, we sold a few, we were gonna do it anyway, but um, yeah, everybody survived. We treated for the worms. Okay. And we don't, like she was saying, we don't baby them for everything, but the worms, yeah. Yeah, you guys are treated. We have lost animals before. I've had them for about four years. And other than apple cider vinegar every once in a while in the water, I've never had to deworm. I'd say once a month in their 40 gallon water trough. Okay, okay. And uh, we did just recently have two processed and they didn't have worms. Now with the hoof trimming, I was curious to know if we have to do it monthly, annually, or even at all. Yes, maintenance. Well, honestly, Heather would be a lot better about answering questions about maintenance. We don't trim hooves. No. Unless we have to. There'll be times when when they it really depends on what kind of what they've got to be on if you've got rocky soil that keeps their hooves yeah i heard that we've got the the people across the street had a bunch of the the flagstones that they were going to do something with and they didn't want it so i brought it over here and we laid them all out in front of the the doorway of the barn so every time they go in and out click 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 they're on that and that helps to keep it down at our last house, it was very sandy soil. So we, th there was nothing really to help them keep it down and therefore we had to trim more often. Okay. Uh, but typically, I mean, if, we've got, if we see one that's getting out of control, we'll trim them up. But that's only, what, a couple times a year maybe? Something that concerned me with the goats was they don't like rain. Something I love about sheep is that they're fine in rain. Like they will go out into the rain but I, I know that we need to provide some type of shelter for them. And what has really kind of sold me on them is that they don't really require permanent structures. And we've been very cautious about doing permanent structures until we really know how we want to lay things out. So that's something that I'm really getting very warmed up about with the sheep is that it's just not that serious. They honestly, when it rains, They'll still graze out here unless it's crazy thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. They will still, like, not a care in the world. So I have a pretty primitive shelters. Okay. This they'll get into just when it's, you know, if it's raining too bad. Some welded wire and a tarp, and I do replace the tarps once a year probably. Uh, most of our, I guess, colder winds come from the north. So I tried to create a good little wind barrier. Yeah. Which is why the door is kind of facing south, I guess. It's too early now, but I'll go in here probably December or January and kind of fill it about a foot with straw. That's good. And that'll insulate them. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I do. It's a little dark in here. So I'll go in and kind of like this area over here, I'll, I'll fill everything about a foot with straw so there'll be no um, yeah. drafts. I can I see the bottom where there would be a draft. Space to um, for everybody to get up. Yeah. And the sheep usually just congregate here in the middle. <laughs> you're done you were done okay there you go that's you, garnish you, you're going to Can do that yoga. uh what was that yoga goat yoga on yeah. me <laughs> and those end up coming in the house little baby
That one's just chewing on That's Gucci. <laughs> her, her name is Gucci. Now let's talk about predators. Around here, we get a lot of coyotes that you can hear in the distance doing their howling. And we wanted to know what type of predators that they encounter with uh, while raising sheep. Biggest concern around here is coyotes. Okay. We do have bobcats. I get them on my game cam down at the pond every once in a while. But the bobcat is not too likely I mean, if they find one of these little babies out at night or something, yeah, they're at risk. But that's why we close them up at night, mm -hmm. so they're safe. And Lily is a great guardian. Uh, a lot of people like the, you know, the Pyrenees and other dogs to mm -hmm. have as guard animals. I like her, and uh, we've had alpaca in the past and llama. I mean, it, there's debate as to whether or not they're really guard animals. <laughs> um, but Milan ornaments. <laughs> the really cool thing about any of those and her is she. She can eat the same thing the goats eat mm. and the same thing the sheep eat. I don't have to have a separate. another dog to feed dog food to. Yeah. <laughs> I actually feel really lucky where we're at that I have never had any predator issues. <laughs> I think there's too many dogs around. Like I have dogs, my neighbors have dogs. Uh, my neighbor, Bud, he has mules, so they kind of keep anything out of there. Okay. Um, we're not, we're kind of in the city, but not, so I think that helps too. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never had a predator issue, so. And this is Lily, and since we're here, and we're talking, we're standing, she's gonna wanna be right in the middle of everything. Yeah. Yeah, you, she's it. a bit dusty. The, she is 30 some years old, we oh, think about wow. 31. She, she's still got the heart, she just doesn't quite have the, uh, the body of it anymore. <laughs> um, before we got her, she was a therapy donkey. They'd put a sombrero on her hat, and take her into old folks' homes and such, and. And just, you know, for the, girl. she is very, very sweet. sweet. Unless you're a coyote. Now, since we just had our extreme summer drought, we wanted to know what was their feed schedule when you don't have enough grass grown because of the drought. So uh, all the grass did die back and I had <laughs> to buy pellets, alfalfa pellets and supplement during the drought. During the drought. But I still did just grass. You know, I will come out here and walk and make sure that the poop is nice and round. There's no diarrhea, I do that also. So if if it's not perfectly rounded little piles of pellets and they're like compacted um kind of like a i don't know if i'm like, finding any but like you like a i guess like pudding if it's yeah, something like that um, if it's runny looking or yeah if it's like a like a solid pile with a little bit of runoff it's so okay. hard describing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that would, if it's not perfect little like rabbit pellets. Yeah, well I'm like. seeing some rabbit pellets down here on the ground. Yeah, yeah if they're not, yeah. not, you know, perfect little pellets like that. Um, yeah. I don't know if you wanna, little pellets, so normally in bigger piles. But. And this is just really, you know, for reference, um, because that is Bill. something I wouldn't know. I was really curious about what their experiences were with the gestation period with sheep. And another thing is, is that we've always made the commitment with any animal that we bring to our property. We want to know how to process. I wanted their feedback on their experience with processing their lambs. The lamb one lamb their first mm -hmm. pregnancy, I guess. And then normally you get twins or triplets. I've only had singles <laughs> with this group. The females go into heat every month. Which is, with sheep, a lot of the sheep, it's only a couple times a year. But every month they can, and then they're pregnant for five months. In theory, if you have a billy around, which ours is pimped out at the moment, every six months you can have new ones born. Mm -hmm. And at six months, they are, well, let's see, the, like the white one with the orange on him and that black one, those are all born in October. So they will be a year old later this month. But within, you know, six months or so, you can butcher them. So I've had them for four years and finally got to where I had I guess an overage <laughs> where I could process. Uh, okay. So from here on out, I think um, probably doing one or two sheep a year, hopefully, depending on what, what they give me. I may have to bring another ram in, obviously. Now, one good point that Chuck brought up was with the cows versus the sheep mentality or raising, where with the sheep, since it was just him and Heather, just like it is with me and Mrs. Necker Gardner, if we needed some meat, we don't have to worry about putting a whole cow in our freezer where we can do a whole sheep and it basically will feed just me and her. You gotta wait two years for them to be big enough. Yeah. You gotta have a lot more space for them. Yeah. So when we were on, on Doomsday Preppers, after that, and even before that, people were asking, why, why do you have goats instead of cows? Well, at the time we had three acres. 
One acre had the house in the yard and then two acres for the animals. On two acres, how many cattle can you have? Barely one. <laughs> one and a half? Yeah. Right? So you got one, maybe two if you're yeah. supplying a lot of feed. Yeah. Goats, we could have 30. Yeah. If it comes down to it and something happens and you can't go to the store for food and you got two cows, not only do you have to kill half of your cattle, you have to figure out how to preserve or consume all of that meat. And at one point, it was just the two of us. And even with the family of four, how, what are you going to do the whole cow? Yeah, that's a whole freezer. In this case, we can go out, if we needed to, we can come out and get a goat and butcher one goat and either consume or preserve that meat to last us for several weeks. Mm -hmm. And we still have another 29 to make more. With every animal we brought to our homestead, there's a learning curve. So I know right off the bat that I want to glean as much knowledge from people that know better. And that is what I want to know, what their learning curve has been with these animals. Definitely have a plan for your rams and your ram lambs. I do feel like I kept a ram lamb too long. Um, What's too long? A year. Okay. Well, no, I guess nine months. Okay. Yeah, because I'm pretty sure he may have bred back to his half sisters, <laughs> which I guess, I mean, may or may not be a problem. We'll see. Supposedly it's not, I guess, or sometimes it can be, I don't know. When you're building shelters, try to build something that is not too permanent um, to begin with until you figure out this is where, you know, year after year with the seasons changing is where you're gonna want your permanent shelter. Um, I will say, uh, if, if I could go back, uh, one thing I would do different is fencing wise, I wouldn't have gone with the cheaper two by four welded wire that's 12, I think it's 12 gauge. And I'd go, go ahead and put everything on the 14 gauge goat and sheep fencing. I feel like when they do test the two by four 12 gauge welded wire, it, it does tend to give out a little more. Um, this is just sturdier. I would have just gone ahead and done it all the sturdy way. Registered animals die just as easy as non-registered animals. And they taste the same too. Yeah. Yeah. So, to coyotes or us. People will always say, oh, I only want registered animals. Why? What, what are you going to do with them? What is the point of that? Are you putting them in a Why show? Why are you pay paying more money for a registered animal when you're going to just eat them? That doesn't make sense to Or me. just look at them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We actually tried that once. We bought a registered uh, doe. And she, she was, miscarried. Yes, yeah, she was pregnant and then miscarried. And then we ended up selling her for Half a lot less we than paid. we paid for. Her. But right. trial and error, you're going to lose goats. That's just how it is. Because we were not raised this way, it has been very valuable for us to find a group of mentors and friends and people that want to help us learn what we're trying to do here. Now with this East Texas homesteading co-op group, we gain a lot of friendships and some mentors throughout this whole progress. Now, we did a video about this. If you want to learn what this group is all about, we'll put that video off to the side in the description down below. Until the next video, let's grow together.